lovely introduction. So thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for being here. A lot of people like to talk about what makes a company good, and a guy named Jim Collins, who some of you probably know, has made a fortune writing books entitled things like Good to Great. I, on the other hand, have somewhat accidentally developed a specialty in what makes a company bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in stories of in stories of business gone wrong or in um, the seemingly good to scandal, as I like to call it, and you know, they all have something in common. In the wake of Enron, I remember thinking that I had had this incredible revelation, which is that if something seems too good to be true, maybe it is. You'll have to forgive me. I was young. I thought this was this amazing insight, and I quickly realized it was a cliche. But I've some since come to real to learn that it actually is this amazing insight. That because this belief in something that, in retrospect, is going to clearly seem to be too good to be true, is at the heart of many business scandals. It was certainly at the heart of the recent financial crisis, where our collective belief that home 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 prices would only go up forever, and that loans made to people who could never pay them back could somehow be turned into secure is as safe as the credit of the United States used to be. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is, it's, it's true of almost every story of business gone wrong that it requires the complicity of the victims, the belief of the great majority of people, and something that in retrospect is going to seem to be clearly too good to be true. And it's something that can make these narratives a little bit unsatisfying. You know, the financial crisis in particular, we all want to find the villain, the bad guy that did this to us. And the real story is, is messier. The blame is spread out in many places. And that's why we came up with the title, All the Devil are here, which I'll, which I'll come back to. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, about my background and how I ended up specializing in these stories of business gone wrong. Um, I graduated from Williams with a degree in math and English, which I guess is a sign of a split personality. <laughs> and ended up at um, Goldman Sachs as an indentured servant or young investment banker. <laughs> And after three years there, I decided that I'd always wanted to be a journalist. So I landed at Fortune magazine as a fact checker. And I got to Fortune and found myself in a bit of a pickle, because if I had ever known how to write, three years of putting together what we used to refer to as GSBS had uh, taken it out of me. <laughs> And so this was, this was the 1990s. It was the beginning of the dot-com bubble. Everybody wanted to write a story about the insta-billionaire, the kid who had founded the hot startup and was now you know, worth, worth billions. And these were these puffy profile pieces. And nobody was going to let me write them because I had a reputation for being debatably smart, but certainly unable to write. So the only way for me to get into the magazine was to tackle the stuff other people didn't want to do. And that was kind of the grungy, hardcore stories about personal finance, what stocks to invest in now. Um, so I did this. I was assigned to do a column called Companies to Watch, which was an incredible learning experience, not because I was good at it, but because I was so bad at it. I was supposed to pick every three weeks, I mean every two weeks, I'm sorry, three stocks that were going to double or triple or quadruple in value <laughs> in the next six months. And you all, you, you're laughing, you think this was difficult, but it wasn't. It was shockingly easy because there were no shortage of people coming by Fortune with these lovely package stories from, and these were from analysts who had buy ratings on the stock to mutual fund managers who own the stock to company executives. And they would lay out these stories that sounded great of why these stocks were going to double or triple or quadruple in value. And I would write them up only to watch in horror as the stocks usually went in promptly the opposite direction. And it was a great lesson for me because it was the beginning of my realization that just because people say it doesn't mean it's so, that a great story and a great stock are not the same thing. And it was the birth of my, what I like to think of as my skepticism rather than, rather than cynicism. So every journalist has a horror story, the, the, thing they, the one they really got wrong. Just ask any of your journalist friends. And mine came um, when I was dating my husband, who cut his teeth as a prosecutor here in Chicago in the US Attorney's Office um, doing white collar frauds. And he was telling me about one of the first companies he had prosecuted, a company called Anacom. And I thought, no, oh no. And I Googled my name, Anacom, and companies to watch. And there it was. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
So the big mark in my career came in early 2001 when I wrote a, a skeptical piece about Enron, and it began when a, a source I had developed doing these grungy personal finance stories, a guy who was short Enron stock, meaning he was betting it was going to go down, called me up and said, tell me if you can figure out how Enron makes its money. And this guy was very amused because Fortune had actually named Enron its most innovative company on its most admired list for the past seven years running. And I like to defend my previous employer by pointing out that Enron actually was the most innovative company in corporate America. <laughs> and I would stand by that even today. Anyway, so the story I eventually published, I think, should have won awards for the meekest title in history. It was, Is Enron Overpriced? I, <laughs> I was going to call it, is, is Enron a Hedge Fund and Drag? But I lost my nerve at the last minute. <laughs> I'll never forget Andy Fasto, the company's former CFO, flew up to New York to convince me why Enron was really a good company. Fasto just got out of a six-year jail sentence. And he said at the end of the meeting, well, I don't care what you write about the company. Just don't make me look bad. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't, actually. <laughs> Anyway, so I started working on my book, and I began to sort of keep a list of, the, of the, the lessons I've collected about these stories of business gone wrong. And the first one, I think, is that business stories are always stories about people, not about the numbers. And they may be about how people make or make up the numbers, but they are stories about the people. Ken Lay, who created the modern Enron out of the merger of two pipelines, was a, was, was a guy who came from really nothing. He was born in Missouri, the son of a Baptist preacher. He had no indoor plumbing until he was 11 years old, and he rose to the heights of American business. But with his rise came fatal flaws, like we all have, and his were a real sense of entitlement and an inability to draw the line between what was his and what was the company's, and a willingness to trust people and continue to collect huge amounts of compensation from Enron um, while not understanding anymore what the business had actually become. Jeff Skilling, who turned Enron into a massive trading company, um, was also a guy who, who came from nothing, grew up in Aurora here, um, worked at McKinsey, and was a guy who other people described as incandescently bright because he had this unbelievable ability to take the most complicated concept and boil it down into these sparkling simple terms that would just capture people's imagination. I remember sitting in a bar with a guy after Enron's bankruptcy, and this guy had worked closely with Jeff, and he said, I blame Jeff Skilling for everything that went wrong at Enron, but if he walked in here with an idea for a new business, I would follow him right back out the door. <laughs> he had that Pied Piper quality to him, and he had another quality that I think about a lot. Jeff was infamous for dividing the world into people who got it and people who didn't get it, and everybody wanted to be included in the group of people who, who got it. And Jeff could be merciless. If it, if, you, if, you, if it explained something and you'd say, well, I don't get it, he'd just turn on you and say, well, how can you not get it? It's so obvious. Everybody gets it. And oddly enough, Wall Streeters, who you'd think would be immune to that sort of pressure, actually hungered most of all to be thought of as smart, to be thought of as one of the people who, who, who got it. And Jeff had another trick, which was the McKinsey data dump. If you asked a question that he didn't want to answer, he'd just give you a ton of data, but avoid answering the question. And people wouldn't call him out on it and say, now, of course, I, 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 I get it too. And I think there's a life lesson here in sort of the old, the old fairy tale of the emperor's new clothes. And it's funny, because I would think that as we all got older, you'd be more and more willing to say, no, I don't, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me. But somehow, as we get older, we often become less willing to say that. I think you feel like you have more to lose. You don't want to risk looking, looking like the silly one who just, who just doesn't, doesn't understand. But often, when you don't understand, there's, there's, a, there's a good reason why. Um, Merrill Lynch, which would have gone bankrupt in the financial crisis were it not for, the, for, the, for its, um, its, its merger with Bank of America, is really a story of Stan O'Neill, its last CEO. And it never fails to amaze me the power that one person can have over a company, even a large company or an organization. And Stan O'Neill, too, in many ways, was, was such an admirable man, a guy who came from really nothing to be the first, first African-American CEO of a, of a major Wall Street investment bank. Um, but he, too, had his fatal flaws. And I think his big one was insecurity. He was always worried that any competent people at Merrill were, were out to get his job. And so over time, he slowly got rid of anybody who he thought, who he thought, might, who he, who, who he thought might, 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 might challenge him for Merrill Lynch's job. 
job. And that had the effect over time of kind of gutting Merrill Lynch's risk management department and turning Merrill into a culture of, 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 of yes men. And the prologue to our book begins when a mid-level risk manager at Merrill Lynch named John Bright has been pushed aside at, at Merrill is being called into Stan O'Neill's office. And John Bright has, has gotten worried about the true amount of, of exposure to subprime mortgages that Merrill Lynch has on its books. So he's done some work and he's figured out the, that Merrill Lynch's exposure has gone from $5 billion to $55 billion in the space, in the space of a year. And so O'Neill calls him into to this meeting and says, well, I hear you, you have a model. And Merrill is about to announce its earnings for the third quarter of, of, of 2007. And they're saying, we're going to lose a couple hundred million dollars, but, it, but it's not going to be that bad. And so Stan O'Neill asked John Bright, well, how much do you think we're going to lose? And John Bright says, $6 billion, but it could be a lot worse. And he said he'll never forget how Stan O'Neill looked at that moment, that he looked like he had been kicked in the stomach and was about to throw up, and that over and over again he kept asking John Bright, well, how could this have happened? And listening to him, Bright realized that he really had no idea of the effects of his actions. He had no idea that Merrill Lynch's risk management department had basically been, been, been sidelined. So the meeting comes to an end, and Bright you know, shakes O'Neill's hands and wishes him luck and says, I hope we talk again. And O'Neill says, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. And so John Bright, O'Neill goes back to his office to contemplate this disaster that he now knows is unavoidable, not just for Merrill Lynch, but for all of Wall Street. And John Bright walks back to this, his desk with this strange realization that he's this mid-level employee who's utterly out of the loop. And he's just told one of the most powerful men on Wall Street that the party is over. And I think these stories of business gone wrong are always this strange mixture of self-delusion, incompetence, venality, maybe a little bit of outright corruption, but they're rarely as simple as people sitting in a dark room plotting to you know, steal shareholders' money from Enron or plotting to take down the global financial system. And as a journalist, you only wish. You, know, you wish you could find that moment where the heads of all the big banks met in a dark, smoke-filled room on, on Wall Street and you know, plotted the destruction of the global financial system, but those moments just rarely exist. And when I started working on my Enron book, I began calling people up, and when I could get people to talk to me, I thought I'd be able to ask them, so how did you do it? How did you commit the fraud in your division? And I thought after a little persuading, they'd say, oh, all right, here's, it. No. here's how we made our numbers up. <laughs> and the funniest thing was that most of them really didn't, didn't have a clue. Many of them were just too busy, and they never lifted their heads up from what they were doing to see how all the pieces fit together, or in this case, didn't fit together. I'll never forget talking to a, um, a very senior guy at Enron who was an experienced guy. He'd worked as a Wall Street investment banker for about 10 years before joining Enron in the last year of its life. And he worked in various different businesses. And in each business, he'd say, this doesn't make any sense. We're booking all these earnings, but the cash is going out the door. But he'd go back to Enron's offices in London, which were overlooking Buckingham Palace, and he'd say to himself, well, the money's got to be coming from somewhere. And I think for people at a more senior level who could have seen, there's often a hefty level of self-delusion involved. Jeff Skilling used to say, I am Enron. And I think for him to admit that Enron had failed would have been to admit that he had failed. And he, and he, couldn't, and he couldn't do that. He still says he's innocent today, and I think, I, think he, I think he believes it. And so I think today there's a lot of anger about the failure to prosecute people in, 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 the, wake of the, in the wake of the financial crisis. Here we are, and no major, no major figures have, have gone to jail. And I have a little bit more, I think, of a nuanced attitude than, than, than many people in the press. I think the simple fact that it is this mixture of self-delusion, venality, maybe a little bit of outright corruption, incompetence, which we're going to come back to, makes it really hard. And you add in these layers of accountants and lawyers and more junior people that can separate top executives from, 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 from their bad decisions, even when they directly profit from their bad decisions. And it's really, really hard to make a criminal case. And none of this is to excuse what, what, what anybody has, has done. I've always loved this line from Joseph Conrad's Lord Jim, and it's the real significance of crime is in its being a breach of faith with the community of mankind. I also like this line from Gulliver's Travels, and believe me, I'm just trying to pretend that I remember my English major. <laughs> but Swift wrote, the Lilliputians look upon fraud as a greater crime than theft, for, they allege, care and vigilance with a very common understanding can protect a man's goods from thieves. But honesty hath no fence against superior cunning. Where fraud is permitted or connived at, 
or hath no law to punish it. The honest dealer is always undone, and the knave gets the advantage. We wrote in our last chapter of, of the Enron book, Isn't Anybody Sorry, that, because no one was sorry, that the larger method, message was that the wealth and power enjoyed by those at the top of the heap in corporate America, accountants, bankers, executives, lawyers, members of corporate boards, demands no broader sense of responsibility. And we said to accept the arguments that nobody did anything wrong, they were just following the letter of the law, my piece of it was fine, is to embrace the notion that ethical behavior requires nothing more than avoiding the explicitly illegal, that refusing to see bad things happening in front of you makes you innocent, and that telling the truth is the same thing as making sure that no one can prove that you lied. But in a lot of cases where people said they did nothing wrong, it was actually technically true. There is a big difference between the unethical and the illegal. And even Enron, which most people think of as this giant fraud, I like to describe it as a legal fraud, because actually most of what Enron did met accounting rules and was signed off by accountants and lawyers, and it was a very difficult, very difficult case to prosecute. And Angela Mazzella, who was the CEO of, of Countrywide, and who many people think of as, as the villain of the subprime, uh, subprime crisis, his company spread bad loans, loans that he famously described in an email as toxic across, across America. And he also pretty much walked away. He settled a Securities and Exchange Commission complaint against him for pennies, most of which was paid for by insurance. And the uh, Justice Department um, didn't, didn't, didn't prosecute him. And people are angry. And I understand the anger, but I also have trouble seeing Angela Mozillo in the simple terms of a guy who set out to commit fraud, which isn't to say that he too didn't have his, his fatal flaws. He also was a guy who came from nothing. He was the son of a butcher born in the, born in the Bronx, um, started working in the mortgage business at age 14. And he always had a chip on his shoulder because he was Italian-American in a time when Italian-Americans couldn't get jobs on Wall Street. And he always felt that Wall Streeters looked down on him because he had gone to Fordham instead of going to an Ivy League school. And he had this, this great desire to build his baby, as he referred to Countrywide, into the largest mortgage originator in the country. And he had this huge belief in home ownership as the key to a better society. And it may have been misguided, but I think it was genuine. And we have this quote from a former executive, and he said, Angelo, he totally believed. He'd say, when I look a homeowner in the eye, I can tell if they'll pay. And would say, Angelo, we don't even do a personal interview anymore. <laughs> And you stop saying you can see it in their eyes. <laughs> but I think Mozilla's real, real fatal flaw was this overwhelming desire to be number one. So Countrywide embraced what it called the supermarket strategy so that it wouldn't lose market share to the shoddy mortgage originator down the street. And that meant if that shoddy mortgage originator made a loan, then Countrywide was going to offer a mortgage on the same terms. So it didn't risk losing any business to the shoddy mortgage originator down, down the street. And Mozilla later said, well, I had to do this. I didn't have any choice because if I hadn't kept up, if my profits had fallen and my market share had fallen, then investors and the board would have demanded my head and I would have been fired. And I think it's a particularly scary comment on the state of American business because in many ways it's true. There's an enormous amount of pressure on executives to engage in practices that appear at the time to, to make the most money. And I think we've lost sight of the long term in many cases in the push for more and more profits today. I did a long piece on Warren Buffett for Vanity Fair, which is one of the few pretty much happy stories that I, that I, that I got, got to write. And the, the thing that stands out to me about what, what Buffett said was he said that the biggest thing he worried about, the most important part of his legacy, was that Berkshire Hathaway would be around in 100 years. And that was because Berkshire Hathaway is an insurance company. It's made promises to pay that stretch out over decades. And he believes his company has to be there to fulfill those promises. And I thought, if more people thought like that, if more people cared, not what profits do I produce today, but is this company going to be here in 100, in 100 years, then we might, we might have a healthier system. I have another funny story about Buffett. When I, when I went to interview him, I, was, I will excuse myself by saying I was six months pregnant. He spent 11 hours with me. And by the end of the 11 hours, I have never been so exhausted in my entire life. <laughs> Warren Buffett is not an easy guy to interview. As a journalist, you're always looking for the person who rambles on so you can kind of frame your next question and figure out what you're going to ask by sort of halfway tuning them out. Buffett doesn't ramble. He answers the question, and then he looks at you. Next question. So, <laughs> so you tend to burn through your prepared questions pretty quickly. So, you know, nine, ten hours in, 
<laughs> I'm running out. And so we get to dinner over his famous root beer floats, and I think, I'm going to get him to talk about charity because everybody, Buffett has famously donated his fortune, the bulk of his fortune, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I thought rich people always like to talk about what they're doing to make the world a better place. So I said, you know, tell me about what you're most proud of that your charity is doing. And he looked at me and he said, Bethany, I, I don't care. That's why I gave the money away, because I know what I want to put my time into, what I'm passionate about, what I'm interested in, and this, this isn't it. So I gave it to people who will do it better than I do. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> no answer. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. My next favorite example of sort of, you know, famous uh, a business gone wrong is MF Global, which is close to home here in, here in Chicago. And it was run um, by a guy named John Corzine, who had run Goldman Sachs, had been the governor of New Jersey, had been the senator from New Jersey. And um, MF Global's collapse came in the fall of 2011, just a year and a half after Corzine had joined the firm. And it was the eighth largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. And you've had this really shocking outcome where some $1.6 billion dollars of customers money which was supposed to be sacred went 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 missing and it seemed obvious somebody would go to jail right somebody had to be responsible but here we are and in, in one of the few cases that has been brought is the commodities futures trading commission sued sued Corzine for failure to supervise um, for just not not supervising his company properly as it and it's a, it's a, it's a civil case and Corzine has said well the CFTC hasn't produced any evidence to support this 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 claim and I liked this block writer I, I like wrote, named Matt Levine wrote this, one reason that it's hard for regulators to bring cases against the heads of big broken financial institutions is that chief executive officers tend not to actually like do all the illegal stuff themselves. They have people for that and those people are the perfect shape and size to fit under buses. So the CEOs can always claim that whatever bad things were done by their underlings without their knowledge or approval. But the fascinating thing to me about Corzine is that in his case, this, this wasn't about money. This wasn't about greed. That's always an easy explanation for business gone wrong. Well, they were greedy. But it's often too simple an explanation. John Corzine could have made a lot more money with a lot less aggravation than going to run this small brokerage, brokerage firm. But people who knew him said that he was the most competitive guy in the world. That, and one person I talked to who knew him well said 99% of people would say, I ran Goldman. I was governor. It's time to go have fun. John looked at it as I was kicked out of Goldman. I was kicked out of the governor's office. He knows that there are people out there who don't like him, and he wants to prove them wrong. He's very focused on reputation and how he's perceived. He wants to be perceived as a winner, and he will do whatever it takes to get there. In Corzine's case, it was about ego, not about money. And so often when people say, well, it's just about corporate greed, I think that's it's too simple a motivation. Ego can be every bit as powerful as, as greed, if not more so, which is not to say that, that, that greed isn't often a part of ego. Uh, I've always loved these numbers from, from Enron, and it's about the amount of money that the top 200 people at Enron made from exercising stock options. And in 1998, they made $62 million. In 1999, they made $245 million. And in 2000, which was the last full year before Enron went bankrupt, they made over a billion dollars from exercising stock options. And the Joint Committee on Taxation, which prepared these numbers, wrote, wrote this, which I love. Although the intent of many of Enron's stock-based compensation programs was to align the interests of shareholders and executives, the Enron experience raises a potential conflict between short-term earnings from which executives can reap immediate rewards and longer-term interests of shareholders. Bingo. Anyway, another, I've mentioned, alluded to this a few times earlier, but another one of my favorite lessons is that you really can't underestimate the incompetence in the world. <laughs> and in some ways, I think it's actually a lot more frightening than outright criminality. I hate to talk about a competitor, but another great, great book about Enron was my friend Kurt Eichenwald's book called Conspiracy of Fools, and I think it's one of the all-time great, great titles ever. And that was very true in the financial crisis as well. I think the best example was the rating agencies, and who famously rated all of these, all of these flawed mortgage-backed securities with AAA ratings, um, securities that later collapsed in value. And in a meeting that was held in the fall of 2007, as this meltdown was starting, one Moody's employee said, that the company's errors in rating this security, these securities make us look either incompetent at credit analysis or like we sold our soul to the devil for a little bit of revenue, or maybe both. 
And I think, I think it was both. Um, it was definitely, definitely some element of this was about money. The rating agencies have always promised that their credit ratings are completely separate from, from the, stand completely separate from the money they stand to make by rating deals. But they're paid by, by the issuers. And so it's a little bit like a sales lady in a store who's going to make a commission by selling you that expensive dress or suit and who isn't going to get paid if she says, hmm, I don't think so. Not so flattering. Earlier this year, the Justice Department sued Standard & Poor's, one of the major rating agencies, over its activity leading up to the financial crisis. And there's this great email in the complaint. Um, in July 2007, a Standard & Poor's analyst wrote to an investment banker, the fact is there was a lot of internal pressure on S&P to downgrade lots of deals earlier before this thing started blowing up. But the leadership was concerned of blanking off too many clients and jumping the gun ahead of Fitch and Moody's, the other two rating agencies. The investment banker wrote back, this might shake out a completely different way of doing biz in the industry. I mean, come on, we pay you to rate our deals, and the better the rating, the more money we make? What's up with that? How are you possibly supposed to be impartial? <laughs> Just FYI, it has not yet shaken out a different way of doing business in the industry. <laughs> But I also think it's a question of competence. Rating agencies are simply outmaneuvered. They're paid less, they're understaffed, and they're up against a force, investment bankers, that employ huge departments who are designed, designed to outfox the rating agencies that they simply can't, can't help to, hope to beat. I think a close second on the incompetence front is actually the financial industry. And if you think about this, the big banks have been cast of the, as the demons of the, of the financial crisis. They must have known what was going on. I, th I think some people did. But on the other hand, both Merrill Lynch and Citigroup knew more than most people about how these securities were being constructed and about the risks in the mortgages, yet they still stuffed their own balance sheets full of them. And that's why both firms almost, almost went bankrupt. And I've always loved this line from our book. I think it's my favorite line. It's a former Merrill Lynch risk manager, manage, management guy, and he describes this saying, we fell for our own scam. <laughs> I think anyway that risk management, with the exception of probably one firm, turned out to be the most oft-repeated yet utterly meaningless pair of words in the time leading up to the financial crisis. I actually did a search once of Merrill Lynch's um, 2007 um, financial report, and I think there were like 87 mentions of risk management and how great risk management, great risk management was, and risk management utterly failed. And there was some acknowledgment of this after the crisis from a very unexpected source. In 2008, Alan Greenspan told Congress, those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself included, are in a state of shock disbelief. And I think that, for me, has some huge consequences for where we are today. There's this tendency to see the banks as evil but smart. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's necessarily right. And I think a large part of the problem is that today's financial world is extremely complicated and getting more complicated all the time. And it's hard, even for a detail-oriented, well-intentioned executive to stay on top of what's happening inside these gigantic financial institutions. And I've sometimes started to wonder if maybe risk management is even an oxymoron. Maybe risk is risk precisely because it, it can't be managed. And kind of the poster child for this is J.P. Morgan, which of course came through the crisis with flying colors. Is one of the few banks that really got risk management right, stayed away from these from the the worst of these subprime subprime mortgages, until that is uh, last summer when the bank lost six billion dollars on a derivatives trade uh, gone gone wrong, and actually J.P. Morgan has lost a lot more than that. This trade has completely destroyed the firm's reputation. They just agreed to spend $920 million to settle civil charges brought by a host of regulators. And as part of its settlement with the Securities and Exchange Commission, J.P. Morgan had to agree that its trading losses, quote, occurred against, occurred against a backdrop of woefully deficient accounting controls and its chief investment officer. And the office, uh, the, 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 another regulator said in its consent order that the bank's oversight did not provide an adequate foundation to identify, understand, measure, monitor, and control risk. And so now, according to the Wall Street Journal, J.P. Morgan is spending an additional $1.5 billion in committing 500 extra employees to get better at risk management, which it was supposedly already great at. I think it's a scary story. Um, 
another lesson to me, people always ask me, well, don't you want to go on to write about something other than business, politics, arts, I don't know. And I always say, how could you ever want to write about anything other than business? You cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> It proves the old adage that truth is stranger than fiction over and over again. Um, and I remember in, in the fall of 2007, some Wall Street sources said to me, well, this isn't going to end until a big Wall Street firm goes, goes bankrupt. And I thought, that can't happen. Look at these huge firms with their, you know, their impressive headquarters and their tens of thousands of employees all over the globe and their billions of dollars in profits. And besides that, I, I've, see, I've seen my financial crisis. You know, I wrote about Enron. It's that we're not going to have another one of these for you know, a bunch of decades. We can't have another one this quickly. I thought, that can't happen. And I was, I was completely wrong. I think if you had gone to Hollywood in, when was it? I guess it would have been early 2009 maybe sometimes, let's say the fall of 2008, and you had pitched a story and said, I'm gonna, I want to write a screenplay about a guy who's managing billions of dollars, and everybody is clamoring to invest with this guy, and you can't get in, and you can't put your money with him, and this is where all the hot people want to have their, their money, and it's going to turn out to be a scam to the tune of $50 billion or whatever the latest, <laughs> latest number is, and his name is Bernie Madoff. People... <laughs> people would have laughed you out of the room. Um, my first Vanity Fair story um, was about a guy named Henry Nicholas who founded a company called Broadcom. And Broadcom is one of the Silicon Valley success stories, phenomenally successful chip maker. And Henry Nicholas, too, had its founder had became a billionaire, but he, too, had his fatal flaws. And in the um, spring of 2008, he was indicted for stock options backdating. And you're saying to yourself, Vanity Fair, stock options backdating? That sounds a little odd. Uh -huh. but he was also indicted for basically running a drug ring. So you say, OK, that sounds a little bit more like Vanity Fair. But that's not all. <laughs> it turned out once he was indicted that these contractors had filed a lawsuit against him alleging that he had built a, a, a lair under his house, a dungeon where he could do drugs and have sex with prostitutes and keep it a secret from his wife. And now you say, Vanity Fair, I, I get it. <laughs> I, I ended the story with one of my favorite all-time lines, and it's a um, quote from Calvin and Hobbes. And, and Calvin asks, do you believe in the devil, you know, a supreme evil being dedicated to the temptation, corruption, and destruction of man? Replies Hobbes, I'm not sure that man needs the help. <laughs> so another of my favorite lessons is to, to listen to the skeptics. And after Enron, everybody asked me, well, you took, you took a tip from a short seller. He was biased. He was betting the stock was going to go down. How could you listen to somebody like that? And I said, everybody is biased in this world. Everybody is biased. What you have to do is find arguments on all sides of the equation and weigh them against each other and decide which one makes the most sense. And one of the problems in the business world is that our business world is one that doesn't reward people who say no. A former countrywide executive who tried to get them to steer clear of, of, of subprime, mortgage, mortgage, subprime mortgages said to me, there are no gold stars in American business for the guy who said no. And that's, and that's true. It means that those, those skeptics are, are a rare breed. And I think what, compl what complicates this is that skeptics are often not particularly likable human beings. They're the people who say the thing at the dinner party that you wish nobody had said. And they're, they're, they're not the people who smooth over the, the, the conversation. And a lot of them are, quite frankly, crazy, as anybody who has dealt with whistleblowers inside a company will, will tell you, and as any journalist who is besieged by would-be whistleblowers would, would also tell you. But skeptics are also the people who see what the rest of us don't see. They're the, one who, there's the, they're the, one, the ones who see that it really is too good to be true when the rest of us are all believing in that thing that's too good to be true. My favorite skeptic in the financial crisis was an independent analyst named Josh Rosner who wrote a report in 2001 questioning the rise in home prices. And the title of his report, you have to think about it for a minute, but it's a home without equity is just a rental with debt. I think it sums it up precisely. Anyway, people, people often ask me, well, isn't it all fixed? I mean, we've put in place this, this new, new legislation called Dodd-Frank that President Obama promised would make the financial system a safe place going forward. 
I guess I am somewhat skeptical of the ability of new regulation to solve, to solve all problems. And in part, I look back to Enron. And in the wake of Enron, we enacted this legislation called Sarbanes-Oxley. And the language when President Bush signed that was shockingly similar to the language that President Obama used when he signed, signed Dodd-Frank, promising to make the financial system safe for all of us going, going, going forward. The problem with regulation is that it's inherently backward, backward looking. It's fixing yesterday's problem while tomorrow's problem is, is coming around the pike. But I think there's another problem, which is that, and I learned this from Enron, which is that rules are often just a roadmap of the possible. And sometimes the more rules there are, the more possibilities there are. Enron was a company that specialized in following the letter of the law while totally violating the spirit of the law. And my favorite anecdote that sums this up is about how Enron's accounting actually worked and how the accounting that appeared on its financial statements would have nothing to do with economic reality. And a former accountant said to me, well, this is how it worked. Say you have a dog, but you need to create a duck on the financial statements. Fortunately, there are specific accounting rules for what constitutes a duck. Yellow feet, white covering, orange beak. So you take the dog and you paint its feet yellow and its fur white and you paste an orange plastic beak, beak on its nose, and then you say to your accountants, this is a duck. Don't you agree that it's a duck? And the accountants say, yes, according to the rules, it's a duck. Everybody knows that it's a dog, not a duck. You can see that by looking at it. But it doesn't matter, because you've met the rules for calling it a duck. The last story I did for Vanity Fair was a piece about Steve Cohen and his big hedge fund, SAC Capital, which just pled guilty and paid a record $1.8 billion um, to, the, to, to the government to, um, to, to, to plead guilty to insider trading. And what's fascinating about this, is there's a funny story, just before the government charged them last spring, um, SAC put out this 42-page white paper that they gave to selected people talking about how great their compliance was, how they had all these lawyers in place, more than any in the industry to monitor things and make sure that they played by the rules. And then the government indictment comes out and charges them as acting as a criminal enterprise where executives encouraged insider trading on a scale without known precedent. And the, the government complaint went on to note that of all the cases of SAC people who have pled guilty, and I think there are eight or nine cases where former SAC traders have either been pled guilty or have been indicted, that SAC's much vaunted compliance didn't catch a single one of those cases. Um, another of my favorite rules is that everything looks different in hindsight, or to put it a different way, the lens through which you see things is going to shift. And I've always loved this quote from Lloyd Blankfein, uh, and I think it's from a 2004 story I did in Fortune on Goldman Sachs. And he said, look, fortunes are going to be made, but the biggest risk is what you can't see today. That's why life is the ability to step outside yourself, to see that something that you can't see today, something that one day you'll hit yourself on the forehead and say, why didn't I see it that way? You won't be able to imagine not having seen it, except that you'll remember not having seen it. And I love cliches sometimes because they're so true. And the best one is hindsight is 2020. Anyway, I want to end on an uncharacteristically upbeat note, which is that there are <laughs> There are lots of really good people in the business world, and I am a believer in business. I remember at the, at the sort of depths of my research on the financial crisis when I was getting really depressed, I found this guy named Dave Zittig, and he ran a small mortgage, um, mortgage brokerage, and he had gotten into subprime lending in 2004, and he was selling all the mortgages he made to a bigger firm. That's the way the business worked. The small guys sold their mortgages to a bigger firm, and the bigger firm called him up and said, Dave, sell us more. Make more of these. And Dave said, well, I can't because I'm re-underwriting all the mortgages at my headquarters, and most of these people can't pay back the, the mortgages, so I'm not granting them. And the bigger company said, Dave, who cares? Just make the mortgages and sell them to us. And he went back to his office, and he thought about it, and he thought, I'm not going to do this. And his firm had just made a couple hundred thousand dollar investment in having the, the software to do these, these mortgages, and he, he shut it down. And so he watched for the next couple of years as the subprime mortgage market went crazy and his peers were you know, buying private islands and flying on private jets and building, manage, man, building mansions. And he thought, I just don't get it. But he still has his business today, and it's thriving. And so I write these stories of business gone wrong. I think I get so outraged precisely because I think business has so much power to do good. And it's business done right that provides necessary products and services and jobs. So while I'm talking to you about business gone wrong, I am all for good to great. <laughs>